Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Diane Karach, and I'm a member of the education team at the International Testing Agency, or the ITA for short. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this 12th and last ITA monthly educational webinars of 2023. Because as we approach the end of the year, it is important that youth athletes and their support personnel to understand how to be prepared with the Youth Olympic Games 2024 in Gangwon, but also with the start of the new year just weeks away. Before we go any further, allow me to do some housekeeping. We deliver this webinar in five languages. On your Zoom menu, you should see a button called Interpretation. By clicking on this icon, you can select a channel with your preferred language. This session is delivered in English, but you can also listen to Arabic, French, Russian, and Spanish. And today's webinar is part of our educational monthly series that are publicly available and designed to tackle any anti-doping topics and to raise clean sport awareness. As all for our sessions, we encourage debate, interaction, and questions, but we do not tolerate any kind of aggressive behavior or abusive or racist language. We trust you all join us with the spirit of fairness, respect, and integrity. Please use the chat to tell us where you are from and your sport or your role. And a big welcome to Malaysia in fencing, Macedonia for tech ball, Mexico and Sweden for underwaters. And a kind reminder that you can use the Q&A to ask us a question on today's topic to our panelists. And we will leave some time at the end for this. We will also use the poll function. So please participate and your answers are anonymous. And finally, note that we record all our webinars. As always, it is my pleasure to give a shout out to our official presenting partner, Informed Sport. Their investments allow us to deliver the webinar program free of charge in five different languages. Inform Sport is a global certification program for supplements that batch tests products for substances prohibited in sport. As supplement contamination continues to be one of the leading causes of inadvertent doping, we encourage athletes and anti support personnel to check all products before use at sport at wetestyourtrust.com. And the ITA is proud to be recognized by UNESCO as a leading international organization for the delivery of anti-doping programs. And this educational webinar is delivered with the support of the UNESCO International Convention Against Doping in Sports. On to today's topic, clean sport for youth athletes. Let's discuss key aspects of anti-doping. So you, youth athletes, you can focus on being the best you can be. We will look at this from an athlete's point of view. And with the help of our panelists, we, who I will introduce to you now. So let's welcome them. And I invite Mark, Randolph, and Claire, who have a multitude experience around major games, to turn on the camera and micro and offer them a warm welcome. Firstly, let me introduce Mark. Mark is a three-time Olympian and a continental record in the 50-kilometer race walk. He has also managed teams attending major games and coached athletes to major games. So he has a wealth of experience to share from a few different perspectives. Welcome, Mark. Hello, everybody. Greetings. Look forward to chatting and looking forward to some really great questions from you all. Thank you very much, Mark. We also have Randolph Oduber. Randolph has played 12 years of professional baseball for the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Dutch team, and for professional teams. He is also on the executive board of the World Softball and Baseball Confederation as an athlete representative. Welcome, Randolph. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, welcome to all and uh, looking forward for all the questions. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you, Randolph. 
And also joining us is Claire Egan, who represented the United States at the 2018 Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang and in World Cup Biathlon. She was elected in 2018 to chair of the International Biathlon Union Athletes Committee and is a member of WADA Athlete Council member. Hi, Claire. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. I'm happy to be here and look forward to hearing your questions and having a great discussion. Thank you. And finally, we have a panelist surprise with Nikki Hamblin, an Olympian who represented New Zealand at the 2016 Rio Games in 1500 meter and a member of the education, ed education team at the ITA. Welcome, Nikki. Hi, Dylan. Um, it's very different to be on the panelist side of one of these webinars, um, but I'm looking forward to briefly introducing you all to the Clean Sport Program, which will be in Gangwon in about a month's time at the end of today's webinar. Thank you very much, Nikki. But what is unique among our panelists is that all of them will be in the Gangwon Games, and you will learn more about that later on. So I am sure we have a young athlete and athlete support personnel joining us who will attend this edition. So Claire, let me start with, with you uh, by explaining maybe what it is like to compete at a major game and the importance of being prepared as possible for all things that could, uh, could happen. Sure, thank you. So. I competed in the Pyeongchang Olympics in 2018, as well as the Beijing Olympics in 2022, as well as over a hundred biathlon World Cup races in my career. So I have done a lot of big events and one of the most important things is being well prepared. It's taking control of the things that you can control. There are always a lot of things that athletes cannot control um, so it's great to do the best preparation you can in order to um, to manage the things that you can control and at the same time be ready to adapt when thing, unexpected things happen. Um, Anti-doping is just a part of doing sport and so that's one thing that athletes should expect and um, be ready for um, if it comes up at a major event. So that's one of the reasons why it's so important for us to talk about that today so that athletes who are preparing for the Youth Olympics and Gangwon know what to expect and um, then they can focus on what they came to the Youth Olympics to do, which is compete their best. So yeah, so be prepared um, in advance with everything that around the, the events and of course, no matter the, the event, whether it is for, for Gangwon uh, or not, so maybe uh, over to uh, over to you, Mark. Claire has talked about the the importance of preparation. So very shortly, uh, why it is important for athletes to receive uh, clean sport education and information. Yeah, Dylan and Claire, thank you so much for the intro into that. What is so important is knowing what you're allowed to do as an athlete and how the whole process works out. So in preparation we believe that you should never have your first experience in anti-doping at an event like the Youth Olympic Games. And that's what we're striving to help athletes to understand, to help coaches and the entourage um, members to understand about anti-doping and how you can protect yourself, how you can ensure that you know what's going to be happening going into your first testing procedure or if it's your hundredth testing procedure that you know that what you've taken what you've consumed is in in alignment with the uh, competition and that's what we're making sure you know and prepare optimally for and my colleagues will enlighten you more on that there we go dylan thank thank you uh, mark and so yeah and we will discuss all the responsibilities and rights about testing later on and let's finish with uh, Randolph. So Mark has mentioned why being educated and informed is important for athletes. But speaking to your experience as a coach of young athletes, how important it is for coaches and other entourage to be educated and informed. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Claire. Yes, as a coach myself right now, I think uh, it's very important. 
um, because young athletes often come to a coach for advice. And as a coach, you want to make sure you're able to give them the correct advice or know where to direct them to get the information they need. A coach is an important influence for young athletes. So the attitude towards anti-doping is very important. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you very much for all of you and more, and more from our panelists later on. So let's go first with the, um, with the, with the slides because we would like to, uh, to start with explaining what doping is, as it is much more than a positive test. Doping, as defined by the World Anti-Doping Code, is the occurrence of one of the more anti-doping rule violations, or ADOVs for short. And do you know how many ADOVs there are? So let's go through a poll question. So it is a single choice. And how many anti-doping rules violations are there? Between one, two to five, six to 12, 13 to 18, or more than 18. So far, we have about 50% of you who responded between six and 12, followed by more than 18. You think that there are more than uh, 18 anti doping rule violations. So let's just give a few more seconds. Okay, right. Let's close the poll and share the result with the audience. For those of you who selected six to 12, you are right. So let's look at the precise number. Here are all the ADOVs listed on the screen and there are 11. This rule clearly tell us what we can and can't do in sport as it relates to anti-doping. The first four ADOVs applies to athletes only as there's four ADOVs 2.1 to 2.4 and can only be committed in relation to doping control. The rest of the ADOVs 2.5 to 2.11 apply not just to athletes, but to administrators, coaches, medical personnel, and other groups of athlete support personnel. And to understand ADOVs 2.1 and 2.2, you must understand that anti-doping is based on the strict liability principle we will talk now. So the strict liability principle means that each athlete is strictly liable for the substance found in their body. In very practical terms, it means that an RDOV occurs whether or not an athlete intentionally or unintentionally used a prohibited substance. Not knowing that something is prohibited or not checking a medication or a supplement is not an excuse. But this begs the question, what are prohibited substances and how do athletes know if something is prohibited? Those are contained in a document called the prohibited list. So the list is published annually on the 1st of January by WADA and lists the substances and methods that are prohibited in sport and when they are prohibited. The current list is the 2023 prohibited list, but the 2024 one will come into, first, into force on the 1st of January. The QR code to the 2024 list is on the screen if you would like to know about the changes for 2024. So substances and methods are in three categories on the list. Prohibited at all times, prohibited only during the in-competition period, or prohibited only for particular sports. For sports included in gang one, this includes some skiing and snowboarding disciplines. So if you an athlete or work with athletes in day sports, Please make sure that you know what it means. But we mentioned in competition. So Randolph, can you please explain us what the in competition period is? Thank you, Dylan. Yes, for sure. I think it's very important. Um, the in competition period is the period commencing at 11.59 p.m. on the day before a competition in which an athlete is scheduled to participate to the end of the competition, including any test after the competition. It's important that any substance prohibited during the in-competition period has left the athlete's system by this time. And to explain the out-of-competition period, 
This is simply any time that is not in competition. And this applies to all sports attending the Gangwon Games. Thank you very much, Randall, for the, the, uh, defining the in-competition period. And let's continue. This slide also shows you all the tools that are available so you can check that anything you may need or take or use that is not on the prohibited list and when it is prohibited. First, you can ask your sport or team doctor. You can also reach out to your national anti-doping organization or you can use a reliable online tool such as Global Draw. And let's go back with, uh, with you, Claire. How did you check if any medication was safe for you to use as an athlete during your career? It is so important to check any medication before you use it. I always checked everything at least twice, maybe three times, um, any medication that I had to use, even if it's something that you think is very simple. It's uh, maybe just something you can easily buy at the pharmacy. Maybe you do not even need a doctor's note. It's just a very simple medication. Everyone uses it. This kind of simple thing still needs to be checked because athletes have different rules um, than your average person. Um, people who are not doing sports don't have to follow anti-doping rules, but athletes have their own anti-doping rules. So it's so important to check everything. Um, I did use the Global DRO website. Um, that website works for medications that are made in my country in the United States. Um, but there's also, uh, from that website, you can also find resources for many other countries as well. So Global DRO is one very good resource I also worked with medical professionals, um, for example, uh, my team doctor or my personal doctor, but ultimately um, the responsibility is solely the responsibility of the athlete. So it was always my responsibility in the end. I had strict liability um, and that's true for all athletes. Um, this, however, means that athletes do um, have important people in their lives who they trust, like coaches and parents. And so if for, for coaches and parents, it's also really important to make sure that if athletes are coming to you with questions, especially youth athletes, um, that, that coaches and parents can help, um, help teach young athletes um, to be responsible for themselves, to check the medications. This is something you can do together, um, but ultimately the athlete has the responsibility. Thanks. Thank you very much, Claire. And yeah, it seems that you were also very lucky to have this professional entourage uh, with you. And maybe in the also in the audience, we have young athletes. They don't have a professional medical personnel with, uh, with them. So maybe for those of you who don't, just make sure that you reach out to your national anti-doping organization for support. And also what Claire mentioned, on, by herself, she checked uh, the medications on um, on Global Draw. Thank you very much, Claire, for your for your feedback. And now on the next slide, I would like to briefly mention what an athlete needs to do if they need to take or use a prohibited substance or method for health reasons. In this situation, an athlete will need to apply for a therapeutic use exemption or a TUE for short. A TUE gives an athlete the permission to use a prohibited substance or method within sports. There is a detailed application process and are strict criteria under which a TUE will be granted. And a link to find more information about this has been included in the resource slide. The slide gives you information on what you need to do if you or an athlete you work with requires a TUE during the Gangwon Games. This is the specific process for gang ones, but an athlete and their athlete support personnel should check the TV process for any major events. And as a kind reminder, you will get the slides after the session has ended 
so you can always refer back to them. But now let's talk with another important topic, which is supplements. It is important to know that supplement use is a risk for athletes because the supplement industry is not well regulated. And this means that supplements can be contaminated and mislabeled, which can lead to inadvertent use of prohibited substances, or importantly, for young athletes. Supplements are not designed and have not been tested on your age group. So they can be a short and long-term negative health effect. And it is important to remember that supplements is not 100% is not risk-free for you to use. So let's jump in into a quick activities for supplements. Here, you can see a pre-workout supplement with the ingredient label. And we have a poll question for you, which is, can you identify the prohibited substance on the label? We have narrowed down the options for you to choose from arginine AKG, folic acid, hygienamine, or tiamine. And for the purpose of uh, simultaneous translation, I repeated all these options for you. But so far, I can see that hygienamine is the most popular answer with about 40%. And it is very tight between option one, option two, and option four. So for those who are listening to the session uh, through a mobile phone, we have the uh, we have seen the, um, the the supplements, and the the idea is to identify the prohibited substance on the label. Okay, right. Let's close the poll and go directly to the next slide to show the right answer. So. The prohibited substance is hygienamine, and athletes have been tested positive for this and have faced periods of suspension from all sports. I would also like to highlight something else on this level. It states that there are 360 milligrams of caffeine in each scoop. Please use the chat to write how many bottles of Coca-Cola you think this is equivalent to. So we look at the, the chat. So we have eight. Who think that maybe it can be more, it can be left. We have 12, 10, 12 again. Some people are saying six. Okay, let's show the answer now. So one scoop of this supplement is the equivalent to 10 to eight those cans of Coca-Cola or four Starbucks single shot espressos. Okay, with a first, uh, first example, let's go to another one. And another supplement and its ingredient label. Again, use the chat to write anything that you think could be a problem for an athlete. So here you can see that it is a supplement for myosin protein. We have Mario saying about problem with uh, cholesterol, drugs. What could what do you think could be as a problem for this uh, for this product? So you can write it in the chat. So yeah, people are saying that there can be uh, sodium, cholesterol. Okay, so. Now here, this is a bit tricky because there is nothing listed on the label that is prohibited in sport. But this product was tested in a lab and revealed the presence of andarin and ostarin, both substances prohibited in sport. Whether this product was contaminated or mislabeled, we don't know. But what we know is that if you use this product and were tested, your test would have been positive and you would have been sanctioned with an ADRV. For youth athletes, you have many years to go and develop in your sport. We recommend a food first approach to nutrition. But let's go back to our panelists who have been there and done this. 
and ask them about their approach to nutrition during their sports career. And let's start with you, Claire. You were in the endurance sports. How was your approach to, uh, to this? I did take always a food first approach to sport. I knew from working with a sports dietitian that I could get everything I needed for my training, all of my energy and strength. I could get it from food. And so the only time that I took a supplement was with if I had a medical test and I had um, something was low. For example, I had low iron. So I tried to um, eat a, a lot of food that was rich in iron. But if my iron was still low, then I took a supplement for iron. Um, so that was the philosophy that I used to um, make sure I had the best energy for my sport and also to make sure that I was not taking any unnecessary risks in terms of anti-doping. I think food is something that athletes can control and with the right nutrition, you can really boost performance in a totally legal way. So um, I, great nutrition is, is something that all athletes and coaches can, um, to, can really work on as part of, their, part of their training and part of their performance. Thank you very much, Claire. So yes, focus on food first uh, approach and remember that no 100% of use of supplement is risk-free. Maybe over to you, Mark. What can you tell us in 30 seconds? Well, so it was always daunting and intimidating for me walking into a pharmacy in the preparation for a big event, uh, in my case, a four-hour event, and trying to work out which supplements to take. Always concerned about whether they might be testing positive and uh, one of the things I tried to do in looking in the shelves was identify these are for pre-competition, during competition, after competition, for rapid recovery, um, for training products. And my guide was always to try and look for something that had the same equivalent of informed sport logo in my country saying that this was suitable for training. And it's also challenging when you're finding a product and you're also trying to get a sponsor to cover it and you've got to really trust the brand. So identifying the brand, understanding what it is, and goes back to strict liability. I've got to do the research for me because it's my body and just making sure that I knew what was being consumed and discussing it with my coach and my team physician. Great, thank you very much, Mark. And let's go uh, to, uh, to Randolph. Your sports involve more power ele elements. How did you approach uh, your nutrition? Yes, for sure. As a professional baseball player, um, nutrition is a big part of staying healthy. We use a lot of energy day in, day out. So I made sure that everything that I ate was safe. And all supplements uh, that I took was uh, batch tested by companies. Because, you know, when you hurt, you have a pain, all the medicines that maybe you can buy in the drugstore might get you a positive test. So yeah, I made sure that I knew uh, what I took. If I didn't know, I made sure to ask my trainers or doctors so I know um, if it's safe or not. Thank you and more on batch tested companies later on. Thank you all for your feedback and let's move on. So as an athlete, if you use supplements or may think about using them in the future, here are a tip, some tips you must do to reduce the risk you must make sure that you receive expert advice based on your individual needs. Take the supplement in the correct dosage. Make sure that the supplement has good evidence of benefits and to health and or performance. And the most crucial thing an athlete must always do is only use supplements that have been batch tested by independent certification companies for substances prohibited in sports. Here are a few companies that we recommend. Let's talk about what to expect if you are selected here for testing. And to do this, it's great that we have our pa athlete panelists who have been tested many times. So let's go directly to the next slide 
with a poll question. Have you or the athlete you work with been tested? The options are yes, no, or I don't know. And a kind reminder that your um, participation to poll questions uh, is anonymous. But for now, over 50% of you said, yes, you've been tested uh, before. Just wait a few more seconds. Okay, let's close the poll and go back directly to our panelists. Claire, very shortly, can you share your first experience of, uh, of testing? Just waiting that we are that we are we have Claire with you with us. So Claire, yeah, if you can just put yeah, great to have you in uh, very shortly your ex first experience of testing. I actually do not remember the first time that I was tested. Um, I was tested many many times in my career, uh, and I guess it became so normal for me that I. I don't really remember, um, but I think I must have, um, I think I saw my teammates and I had some education about anti-doping before I ever experienced my first test. And that really helped me as an athlete to feel calm and confident when I went to my first test. Um, I think it's also important to remind young athletes that even if it is your first test, the, the um, adults who are doing the anti-doping testing, they have done this many, many times. So um, there's nothing to worry about. Um, also, youth athletes are always accompanied by um, an adult. Um, and so they 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 won't be going through the process alone um, and that's something that they can feel comfortable about thank you claire and let's go directly to, to you randolph because you also have been tested uh, many times can you share your your first experience yes thank you dylan well me on the other side uh, my first time i do remember uh, i was nervous because I didn't know what it is. I heard about the testing. I, I knew about, uh, you know, being safe and all that, but I never experienced one before. And it was just a couple of days after I signed my first professional contract. So I didn't know how everything went. I didn't know, for example, that, uh, you know, someone was standing next to you and all that. So, but after that, you know, you get educated and all that. So uh, it was a good experience and uh, we learned. And for the young athletes out there, you know, don't be nervous. It's a, it's a process and uh, you will be safe. And like Claire says, all the representatives that they be in there are well educated and they, they know what they're doing. So um, there's no reason to be nervous. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, the first experience is, is a first experience and we have seen it through Randolph uh, and Claire. Mark, over, over to you. What advice do you have for youth athletes about um, how they can think about um, about that. Yeah, if you can just put, yeah, great to have you. So very shortly, what can you tell us? Yeah, so the big thing is that before you even going into competition, you need to know what your, your rights are and what you're needing to be doing within the process. I always had to think about um, taking a piece of identification with me for the possibility that if I had a really good competition, I might um, set a, a new national record or even a continental record, in which case you've got to sometimes go for a voluntary um, doping testing experience. And I just find that if the better you've planned for all your actualities before an event, the easier it is for you to go straight into that process and feel totally confident that you've got everything prepared. Uh, for me, just as a side note, it used to take me 12, 500 more bottles to be able to produce a urine sample. So it was really difficult and I needed to have all my planning done before the competition started. 
Thank you very much, Mark. And more on the um, on the rights and responsibilities now, as we have a video courtesy of Japan Anti-Doping Agency showing the testing process. So let's play the video now. I hope you found the video helpful. And here on the next slide are certain responsibilities during the testing process, including reports for testing immediately once notified, show valid identification, remain in direct sight of the doping control officer or chaperone at all times, and comply with the sample collection procedure. Alongside responsibilities, athletes have also rights, which includes have a representative with them. For young athletes, we always recommend that you have a representative with you. Request an interpreter if available. Ask for a chaperone or a doping control officer identification. Ask any questions. Request special assistance or modification for valid reasons. Record any comment of the doping control form and request a delay for valid reason. And to pick up on the specific right of athletes to have modification for a valid reason. For a minor athlete, there will be modification to the testing process. In anti-doping, an athlete under the age of 18 is considered a minor. The main modification to the process you should be aware of are a minor should be notified that they have been selected for testing in the presence of another adult. For example, a team manager. If you are a minor, you are strongly encouraged to have a representative with you throughout the process, including in the doping control station. Where sample collection involves an athlete who is a minor, the testing authority shall assign at a minimum two sample collection personnel to the sample collection session. At no point, a chaperone or a doping control officer uh, will be left alone with a minor athlete. When an athlete provides a sample, the doping control officer or the chaperone watching the athlete must always have a second observer. And importantly, as you can see in the image, the second observer will not be able to see the athlete passing the sample. As for any other athletes, it is important that at any point during the testing process, you can ask questions 
to ensure that you are confident and happy with that. Now, I would like to offer some advice for athlete support personnel to support the athlete during testing. Firstly, you play a key role developing the narrative around testing. So make sure this is a positive experience. You may act as the athlete representative during doping control. Observe the process is being followed correctly and support your athlete with tasks like checking the sample code and adding any comments to the doping control form. If you are the athlete representative in addition to the athlete, you should sign the doping control form to indicate that you're satisfied it is accurate. Here are additional tips for youth athletes. If you are in a testing pool, remember to keep your whereabouts accurate and to update at all times. This includes during major game events such as gang one. If you see here, um, no or suspect doping in sport, report it. You can do this to the ITA, WADA or UNADO. And we have included links in, on the resource slide to some reporting platforms where you can report confidentially and anonymously. And remember the consequences of an LDRV, even if it was unintentional, because you don't know or understand your responsibilities as an athlete are significant. There is consequences will not only affect on you, but your family, teammates, and support team. And to protect yourself, from these consequences. We recommend that you invest time in clean sport education. There are many options for you to do this. UNADO may have resources or programs for you, or you can do the WADA e-learning platform named ADEL. We highly recommend the e-learning course for talented athletes competing at major events, available in English, French, and Spanish for those attending Gang One. Feel free to test as well your knowledge and see how much you know. I will just pause here a few seconds so you can scan the QR code. And before uh, our live q and I would like now to hand over to Nikki, who will talk about some on-site activities happening in Angwang. The floor is yours, Nikki. Thank you, Dylan, um, and hello, everyone. Um, it's great to have you all with us today. So as Dylan mentioned, I'm here to briefly talk about the Games Time Clean Sport activities available for everyone who will be in Gang One. So the International Testing Agency and the World Anti-Doping Agency will collaborate as one team for clean sport to raise awareness and deliver education for athletes and their entourage. And this initiative is part of the wider athlete education program, which is a key pillar of the Youth Olympic Games. So clean sport education activities, um, some of which you can see on your screen, will be hosted by our ITA education ambassadors, including Mark and Randolph, who are here in the webinar today, and Anna Yelusik. And there will be further engagement offered by the wider athlete council members, um, including Claire and other Olympians who are all role models in clean sport. So these activities will be available in both villages during competition days. So we encourage all athletes and their entourage um, to come and visit us, complete a fun and interactive education activity and to ask us any questions. We have all been there, we have all done that um, and we are really happy to share our experiences. Um, and they're also going to be asked, you will be asked to join our one team for clean sport, which promotes um, sport without doping. Um, and Claire, as I mentioned, Claire will also be in Gang One um, as a WADA Athlete Council member. And I will hand over to her to explain um, some of the WADA initiatives. I am really looking forward to seeing you all in Gang One. Um, I will be at the World Anti-Doping Agency booth, um, WADA. WADA's uh, purpose in Gang One is to promote um, and raise awareness about clean sport uh, directly with athletes. So I'll be there and we, um, we have really exciting prizes um, at the WADA booth. Um, we also have, um, we'll have some 
table tennis. Uh, we will have the opportunity for athletes to have their picture on the cover of the Play True magazine. Um, we'll be making social media posts to engage with athletes. Um, and yeah, really good prizes. So please come visit us um, at the One Team for Clean Sports booth in Gangwon. Thank you all for presenting these uh, on-site uh, activities. And we will shortly start with the, with the live Q&A. But before, on the, on the next slide, this is the main places um, I will point to if you want to learn more, to have more information on the topic that we have uh, covered today. Maybe in the audience, we have people from National Olympic Committee or from NATO and who want some signposts to resource and inspiration for clean sport education for youth athletes. So check out the NOC Clean Sport Education Guide for your athletes. And there is a link in this resource slide. Okay, right, let's go now to our live Q&A. And I would like to, uh, to invite all our panelists to uh, put camera and micro on. Just waiting for uh, for you for you, Mike. Okay, great. So you may have seen that we have many questions in the uh, in in the Q and A. So we have the the first one from uh, from uh, Pramod. Maybe first of all, uh, try to uh, to rephrase the the question. What are the, the main uh, reasons at, uh, at it will uh, will dope? Maybe let's start with you, Nikki. You are the first on the on my on my screen. Thank you, Dylan. Um, I would guess just uh, answer this really briefly. Um, I guess from uh, someone who works in the education space, the things for education space. Um, we often see um, that doping is very much related to um, athletes' vulnerability moments. Um, you know, I think all of us who have experience in sport know that um, it isn't smooth. It's never a smooth journey. We experience challenges. Um, and sometimes these challenges um, can make us vulnerable. You know, for example, if you are injured, if um, you risk losing your funding because you haven't performed well, um, other vulnerability moments we see is, you know, pressure to perform from an entourage. Um, so for me, um, I think these vulnerability moments really um, can, in certain situations, if athletes don't get the right support, um, lead to doping. Um, but maybe, I don't know if anyone else uh, of our panel of athletes wants to jump in um, and speak any more about that. Great. Thank you very much, Nikki, for, uh, for, your, for answering this, um, the, this first question. Uh, unless uh, Randolph, Claire, or Mark, if you would like to uh, to, to add add anything uh, related to, to the um, to that first uh, first question, but yeah, otherwise let me let me go with the with the questions we have from uh, Nilhan Husman. Uh, is there an official education and certification required for being an athlete representative during um, during testing? So, for example, the uh, the ITA has a doping control officer course where uh, where you wanted to, to learn more about um, about this process. And if you want, you can go to ita.sport and you will see that there is a resource section for. Um, for the for that, if you want to uh, to take this course, or feel free to to take it, so uh, you be, you become a, a doping control um, officer. So Dylan, um, perhaps I could just jump in on that as well. Um, so yes, definitely, um, doping control officers, chaperones, um, blood collection officers, um, all have to be trained and authorized by anti-doping organizations. Um, perhaps in terms of um, and being an athlete representative. Um, anyone can be an athlete representative. Um, it could be a coach, it could be a parent, um, it could be a teammate. Um, there's no uh, there's no qualification um, required to be an athlete representative, but of course um, it is beneficial if someone who's supporting the athlete through that process understands um, what is happening um, and you know knows their role within all this. So that's kind of why we encourage all athlete support personnel um, to engage with education. 
um, because this is the key role um, that they can play, particularly um, for youth athletes. Great, thank you very much, uh, uh, Nikki. Uh, we have a we have a tricky question from Dr. Ashmin uh, Bandari, which is. Is it necessary that the athletes have all food in the international uh, event in the spe specified kitchen? So if an athlete have a, a local taste food and he's contaminated and is tested positive at uh, 11.59 uh, the day before the, the event. So very, uh, very briefly, first of all, trust um, food sources such, such as in uh, Olympic Village, so you avoid a uh, risk of food, especially if you are traveling to, to a high risk countries and cook also your, your own meals. But maybe um, let's go with, with, uh, with you, Claire. You, you were in, um, in, in the Olympic Games, so you had, um, you had food in the, in the Olympic Village. Maybe can you, can you share your experience uh, uh, on that? Sure. So um, at both the Olympic Games that I participated in, um, and I also was recently doing some um, work with World Anti-Doping Agency at the Pan American Games in Chile. So that's an another example. Um, at all of those events, um, the cafeteria, like the dining, the restaurant for the athletes had a lot of different options. So um, there's some food for everyone there. Um, so even if you, you know, you will maybe have a certain food you eat at home, or I really think that everyone can find something good to eat in the dining center of a major event. Um, so, so that's the good news. Um, I also think that um, it is important, of course, anywhere to, no matter where you are, if you're at home or if you're traveling, um, just to be careful as an athlete about what you're eating. And so um, if you think that you, if you have a concern about something that it might be risky or you've never tried it before, um, the, you know, a major event is not a good time to, to try something totally new. And that's true about nutrition. And it's also true about training. It's just in general, it's good to um, try to stay with things, you know, um, so you can always bring some snacks from home too. Um, you know, maybe things like your any any kind of uh, snack food or bars, things like that that maybe you eat while you're training or competing. You can I would recommend bringing those things from home so you don't have to make changes for your big competition. Hope that helps answer this question. Great, thank you, uh, thank you, Claire. And maybe over to you, Mark. So Claire mentioned that the, to bring your own food, bring your own snacks. What is something that also you uh, you did, and what uh, what uh, further advice you would have for for youth athletes who will come to uh, to Gangwon, for example? Yeah. So one of the biggest challenges going into a games village as an athlete is just how much time you can spend in the games village between events or building up to events. And you'll find often that a, a breakfast can merge into a lunch and can merge into a dinner in a games village. And one of the biggest challenges more often than not is the huge variety that a lot of athletes aren't familiar with and how social it becomes into the games where you meet friends from different sporting events. And I, for one, found that exceptionally challenging watching over athletes in my team that would sit there for four hours because there was so much food to try and so many varieties and it's quite intimidating and mesmerizing and then within what you're trying to eat you've always got to remember that what you ate to qualify might not be the same meals that they're providing and it's really important as an athlete to know what's the closest to what they been training on at home and bring or look out for alternatives that they can find in a games village where there's just so much variety. And I, I would just lead Nikki into that understanding different things to eat for different events is, is a really bigger challenge than whether or not you get what you're used to. It's, it's what you're not used to in a games village. That's the biggest challenge, in my opinion. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, Randolph, I think we have a question interesting for you related uh, from uh, from Emma Hutton-Smith. 
who said, uh, what would you suggest that is the best method of uh, receiving a education and um, in general for, for athletes? You have experience as an athlete, but also with um, for coaches. What advice uh, would you provide? Uh, thank you, um, Dylan. Well, education part, you know, um, with the WSC, we try to do a lot of um, being present during tournaments and educate all of our, our, um, our athletes. Also uh, online, there's different websites like ITA, WSC, WADA. You can educate yourself with a um, bunch of information that is needed that, um, you know, before go and ask, you know, mostly all information is online. And um, one thing I want to add as well is um, you, are, you, the athlete, is in control of everything that you, you are taking. So back to the question before about um, the food, for example, you're the one responsibility. You're the one responsible for taking it. So make sure you know what you're taking and educate yourself what is good, what is bad. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Rondo. What an impactful final uh, response for our live Q&A. But for the purpose of time, uh, where we have to move on, but if uh, there is any uh, questions later on, or if your questions have not been uh, answered in the Q&A, feel free to email us at um, education at rta.sport. And to our athletes panelists, do you have final words for youth athletes? Uh, Claire, let's start uh, with you first. My important message to youth athletes is that you can win clean. So there is actually no reason to dope. It's definitely possible to win clean. I did it. You can do it. It's definitely the best way. It's how you can get the most joy out of your sport. Um, and so compete clean. You can win clean uh, and enjoy your sport. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, very short and uh, message uh, from for youth athletes and they support personal. Mark, what else can you can you add? Uh, one of the most important things is just in terms of your preparations. It's important to know that the 2024 prohibited list produced by WADA will be made available in the new year, and that will be applicable to to the gang one game so please make sure that you and your entourage are familiar with it and you can find the resources as mentioned previously available at on this presentation and you can download it from the water website good luck to everyone competing and come and chat at the booth thank you very much mark for reminding youth athletes that the 2024 list will be uh, applicable as of 1st of January. And let's pass the ball to uh, to Randolph. What final message do, do you have for youth athletes? Yeah, thank you. I uh, just want to wish all the athletes good luck, all the best, play hard, play clean, stay safe always, and remember everything you take is for your own, own good, own health for the future, to stay safe. And remember to come visit us. We will have games activities and prices so and don't forget to ask us uh, questions thank you all for this final and powerful uh, words so after the the webinar ends you will receive a link to our survey along with the presentation slides we ask you to please take a few minutes to fill it out as your feedback is very valuable to uh, to us and finally if you'd like to receive updates from the ITA you can see that you have a QR code on the left of the um, of the image. And that's wrap up our today's webinar. A big thank you to our four panelists. And of course, a big thank you to our audience. We hope you found the session valuable. And finally, best of luck to those attending the Youth Olympic Games Gangwon 2024 and to all of you for 2024 as well. Thank you once again all and have a great rest of the week.